Uh, Lawrence, before I begin, I just thought I would, uh, you, you said that we're all sharing molecules from the breath breathed by Feynman, but you didn't say how that can be true. And so I would like to add information to this, that Excellent. it is true because for every breath you take, you inhale more molecules of air than there are breaths of air in the entire Earth's atmosphere. And it's because of this fact that any time someone has exhaled in the past, there are enough molecules to spread into everyone's breath. And so what is true for Feynman would be true for any person throughout history, including Genghis Khan, Beethoven, you, Jesus, whoever is your person. No, real people. You, you're <laughs> sharing. <laughs> Uh, if you look at our closest genetic relative to human beings, it would be the chimpanzee. We're, we share like 98 plus percent identical DNA. We are smarter than a chimpanzee. So let's invent a measure of intelligence that make humans unique. Let's say intelligence is your ability to like compose poetry, symphonies, do art, math and science, let's say, okay? Let's make that as the arbitrary definition of intelligence for the moment. Chimps can't do any of that. Yet we share 98, 99% identical DNA, okay? The most brilliant chimp there ever was maybe can do a little bit of sign language. Well, our toddlers can do that. Toddlers. So here's what concerns me deeply, deeply. Everything that we are that distinguishes us from chimps emerges from that 1% difference in DNA. It has to, because that's the difference. The Hubble telescope, these grand, that's in that 1%. Maybe everything that we are that is not the chimp is not as smart compared to the chimp as we tell ourselves it is. Maybe the difference between constructing and launching a Hubble telescope and a chimp combining two finger motions as sign language, maybe that difference is not all that great. We tell ourselves it is, just the same way we label our books optical illusions. We tell ourselves it's a lot, Maybe it's almost nothing. How would we decide that? Imagine another life form that's 1% different from us in the direction that we are different from the chimp. Think about that. We got 1% difference and we're building the Hubble telescope. Go, one, go another 1%. Yeah. What are we to they? We would be drooling, blithering idiots in their presence. That's what we would be. We would, th they would take Stephen Hawking and roll him in front of their, their uh, primate researchers and say, well, this one is like the most brilliant among them because he can do sort of astrophysics in his head. Oh, isn't that cute? Little Johnny can do that too. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> In fact, Johnny just did that. Let me get it. It's, it's, it's on the refrigerator door. Here he is. He did it in his elementary school class. Think about how smart they would be. Quantum mechanics would be intuitive to their toddlers. Whole symphonies would be written by their children and, like I said, just put up on the refrigerator door the way our pasta collages are on our refrigerator doors. <laughs> hours a day to try to solve this and not you just to kick concern it about Congress. Wow. I, I, I checked these numbers. 57% of Senate, 38% of the House cite law as their profession. And when you look at law, law is, well, what happens in the courtroom? It doesn't go to what's right. It goes to who argues best. And there's this urge, there's the, whole, the entire profession is founded on right. who the best arguers are. Right. It's not, a courtroom is not about the truth. It's about 
that they, that the theory, I, I, if I get what you're saying, is that everybody, are, each side argues their version, and then the truth somehow emerges. That's the premise. However, the right. the practice, which, for example, is bred in debating teams, for example, where right. you know the subject, but you don't know what side you're going to put be put on to argue. Right. And so the act of arguing and not agreeing seems to be fundamental to that profession, and Congress is half that profession. And I, 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 I realized this when I was a kid. I was 12 and I said, oh, I wonder what profession all these sen senators and congressmen were. Law, 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 businessman, law, law. And I said, there are no scientists, we're the engineers. Where's the rest of life represented here? And so, so when I look at the conflicts, the argumentative conflicts, I just sit back and say, you know, can I buy an engineer, please? Or sign, put somebody, a, a, business, a, 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 or a business person who knows how to make a hard but, a, but, but a significant financial decision because at the end of the day, they got to make their, but their, their books work. Let's get to the exploded rocket okay. on the launch pad. Um, what, one thing we've failed to do in the educational system is alert people that if you're doing what no one has done before, mm -hmm. stuff goes wrong. And in fact, if nothing ever goes wrong in what you're doing, if you make no mistakes in your job, in, your, in whatever task you've brought upon yourself, then you're not on the frontier. Simple. Mm -hmm. it, it's true in science, and I heard it applied to car racing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a quote that I'm, I'm told, spoken by Mario Andretti. He said, if you are in complete control of your car, you're not in the race. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! <laughs> There's something that yeah. you're just not completely in control of, I take that and only then can. And that's the same thing I'm describing mm -hmm. for when you are on the frontier. And SpaceX is on the frontier, not a space frontier where they're going farther than NASA has gone. They're on another kind of a frontier, a frontier where they want to make access to space maximally affordable. So. That means they have to design their rockets differently from how anybody else had done it before, mm -hmm. and they're going to be mistakes. So I see the exploded, uh, explosion on the launch pad, and I say, that is a, an occurrence that is rich with learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not just a spin, it's real. Yeah. And, and it's, yes, it's a spectacular explosion because the whole rocket is filled with fuel. But uh, it's typically one little thing that went wrong that they had not anticipated. They have to design it differently. Mm -hmm. Go back to the early days of NASA. This footage on YouTube. Yeah. It's rockets blowing up all the time. Mm -hmm. Because no one had put rockets in space before. So now they're trying to do it in a whole new way. I'm, I'm going to expect that and more of it. One of the problems with science in schools is that we are taught science as subjects. There's history, science, English, Spanish. It's a subject, and then you learn stuff about that subject. But that's not really what science is. Science is a way of querying nature. There need to be classes on what science is and how and why it works. Then you are empowered. You are inoculated against throwing a snowball in Congress, if that's how you were trained to think about the natural world. But if science is just a satchel of facts, well, I choose these facts, those are your facts, I got my facts, and those are your facts. And the, the idea that you can interact with this information in a fundamental way and, ex and extract that what, which is bogus and that which is not doesn't seem to exist in the minds of people who have, and also, by the way, just to be clear, there is no shortage of people on the liberal left who are in denial of mainstream science just as you have them on the conservative right. The people who are anti-vaxxers are primarily left-leaning people. The people who are all into alternative medicine, which requires at some level that you reject mainstream medicine, are primarily people on the left. The people who are into odd, unusual, peculiar diets, they're people on the left. And so, the, now they're, so these are different issues, of course, but when I hear left people speaking of Republicans being anti-science, and I go down the list of things that are squarely in the, in the portfolio of left-leaning people, I, I offer no, I'm not choosing sides with you. And with regard to cell phone use, uh, there's some, a very important fact of science, and that is the act of measurement 
it, it's a fascinating thing, measurement, because you can never measure anything precisely. You can, that is, with unlimited precision. You can only measure it with the uncertainties of your measuring device. And all you can do in the lab is try to constrain how uncertain that measurement is, but at some level it will always be uncertain. And here's what happens. If there is, if you're trying to measure a phenomenon that does not exist, the variations in your measurement will occasionally give you a positive signal as well as a negative signal. If that positive signal is the idea that maybe A causes B, in this case cell phones cause cancer, a paper gets written about that result and then people, people get concerned that cell phones might cause cancer or power lines might cause cancer. This goes way back. And so, in fact, if you look at the full spate of these studies, even those that they thought not to publish because it was not a positive effect, there's some cases where in fact there's less cancer. And so these are the phenomenon of a no result. When you actually have A causing B, the signal is huge. It is huge and it's repeatable in time and in place. With cell phones, that repeatable signal is yet to be emerge from the total experiments that are done on it. That being said, if you're worried, almost every cell phone you can, you know, they have the, the cell phones on your hip and you've got an earpiece. So just do that if you're worried. But uh, otherwise, we, I can either say the jury is still out or the experimental results are consistent with no effect at all. If you look at the chemical ingredients of life itself, uh, you remember from biology class, we're mostly water. And good old water is H2O. Two hydrogens, one oxygen. And if you could look at the sort of the element budget of life, hydrogen is number one as expressed in the water molecule. The number two in the human body is oxygen, turns out. Number three in the human body is carbon. Four is nitrogen. Five, you find on all lists, is other. Okay, <laughs> now if you go to the universe, <laughs> that's the O on the periodic table, you didn't know that? <laughs> that's not for oxygen, it's for other. Um, so, you go into the universe, number one ingredient in the universe is hydrogen. That was true in life. Number two in the ingredient in the universe is helium. We don't have that yeah, one. Yeah, it doesn't, nope. doesn't like but, anybody. No, how come? Well, because helium is chemically inert. You can't do anything with it even if you wanted. Or you can inhale it, okay? <laughs> and sound like Mickey Mouse, yes. Next in the universe is oxygen. Next, carbon. Next, other. Thank you, in the third <laughs> row there. So. Actually, that was the second row. They must be related to the second row here. We are one for one matchup with the most abundant ingredients in the universe. Of these, carbon is the most chemically fertile element in the entire periodic table. You can make more kinds of molecules with carbon than all other molecules combined. So, if you were going to experiment through the forces of nature with complex chemistry, and you had to pick an element to base it on, carbon is your man, or your woman, however that goes. Okay, so, what I'm saying is, given, the, given the, what carbon is capable of doing, perhaps we shouldn't be so surprised that there's life, because we are carbon-based life, we're just another one of the things carbon has rolled up its sleeve. Maybe life is inevitable, given the abundance of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and hydrogen in the universe. I'm try, try to invert that view. Otherwise, you're left thinking, hey, we're special. You know how you know I would give you right to say you're special? If life on Earth were made of an isotope of bismuth. <laughs> that stuff is nowhere in the, in the cosmos. And then we're made of it, we're special. Okay, but if we're the most common ingredients of the ingredients of the, of the matter that we know and love, you don't have an argument. Carl Sagan used to say to me, 
it would be arrogant for us to believe that we are the only intelligent life in the entire universe. It'd be pig-headed. Yeah, there's no... <laughs> yeah, I just, again, the sheer numbers that are involved, not only how many stars in the galaxy and how many galaxies there are in the universe, yeah. and as it is now becoming apparent that planets may be common around stars, for us to think we're the only life, uh, there's, there's, no, there's no way to, to justify that given the sheer numerics of it. In addition, the chemistry of life, the carbon molecule, molecules, the, the carbon chemistry that drives life as we know it, would be common everywhere in the universe because carbon is everywhere, everywhere we look. Yeah. So if we were made of bismuth or some unusual element, then we might have the right to assume that we're unusual. But we're made of the most common stuff in the universe. Your best guess that there is life of an intelligent form similar to us somewhere else in some other place. Yeah, I think it's, it's well... Likely? Probably? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm riding the fence on that because if you look at the history of life on Earth, by most definitions of intelligence, nearly all life that has ever existed on Earth has not been intelligent, yet it's been getting along just fine. So it doesn't appear that intelligence is a prerequisite to, to survive to, right. and to exist. And so I'm happy just looking for life at all, all right. whether or not it can do complex mathematics. Yeah, I don't know if you saw this, Key and Peele parodied me and my wife. Uh, not knowing that my wife has a PhD in mathematical physics. They did not know this. So. Key and Peele are dressed up as me and as my wife. And my wife comes up to me and says, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you haven't taken out the garbage yet. And, and I stand there and I say, but in the multiverse theory, there could be a, a parallel universe in which I actually have taken out the garbage. So, and we don't know at all times by the quantum uncertainty principles which universe we might be in. So that in fact, this could be the universe in which I had taken out the garbage. And, and my wife goes, oh, wow, okay. So there's a series of these where he basically gets away with murder, yeah. right? But, but Cosmos is his way out of, the, out, of the, out of the responsibilities. And so people say, well, how do I feel? And I say, I, I don't feel, I don't invest emotion in what artists do. What I do is applaud the fact that there are artists of all kinds, musicians, actors, comedians, that have found the moving frontier of science as legitimate sources of their inspirational muse. And that, I think, is something to celebrate.